Professor Stephen Vassiani, President, members of Council, and uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps. We have High Commissioner, Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, His Excellency Fitzgerald Jeffrey, other university officers, Deputy President, Professor Colin Giles, Acting Registrar, Mrs. Mercedes Dean, Mrs. Andrea Golding, wife of our professor who's lecturing this evening, along with family and friends. All come from overseas, I understand, or most from overseas to be here. Wonderful. Welcome. Faculty, staff, students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you are actually in the University of Technology main campus, on the main campus, and this is a brand new facility and you're feeling and smelling the newness as well. <laughs> and this is a new lecture, the, fir the, the, the first lecture by our professor, Professor Paul Golding, and I know we'll have a very enriched evening this evening. Good evening and welcome to the University of Technology, Jamaica. I think it is befitting on this occasion to have the proceedings blessed, and so I'm going to invite our dearly beloved chaplain to offer prayers at this time, Mrs. Carol Richards, chaplain at the university here. Mrs. Richards. Good evening, everyone. In the words of Professor Golding, this has been a hallelujah journey, and this entire hallelujah belongs to Jesus Christ, who is truly amazing, awesome. And in the words of Daniel, in the book of Daniel, Daniel also praised God, saying, praise the name of God forever and ever. He has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of this world events, of world events. He removes the kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. May we all stand and give God praise and pray for the proceedings for today. Father, we bless your name and we praise you because there is no other God but you. You have indeed blessed your son, your servant, in a special way. And today we join in celebrating with him. And we ask, O oh God, for your presence, that your spirit will fill this room, that we will experience you through him, and that as he shares with us today, as everyone share with us today, that you will guide every step of the way and every word that has to be said this evening. We give you thanks, Lord. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Mr. Hector Wheeler, Associate Vice President, Advancement and Master of Ceremonies. Members of Council, Professor Colin Giles, Deputy President. Mrs. Mercedes Dean, Acting University Registrar. Professor Paul Golding, Dean of the College of Business and Management. And Mrs. Andrea Golding and family. Carol Gunsley. <laughs> <laughs> Negotiating partner. His Excellency Fitzgerald Jeffrey, High Commissioner, Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Other members of the Diplomatic Corps. Vice Presidents of the University of Technology. Associate Vice Presidents. Deans. Heads of school, professors, members of academic and, admi and administrative staff, students, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. It is my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us this evening for the University of Technology Jamaica's inaugural professorial lecture by Professor Paul Golding Dean of the College of Business and Management. I take this opportunity publicly to congratulate Professor Golden 
on his recent appointment as Professor of Management and Information Systems and thank him for his contribution to the continued development of this university. We are in the midst of orientation for new students. So for the university, it is a good time to host Dean Golding's inaugural lecture. It symbolizes the importance we attach to research and development at the University of Technology. Congratulations again, Professor Golding, on your well-deserved elevation. I would like to, to note that there are associate professors, senior lecturers, lecturers, and others who should be inspired by this evening. So you are an inspiration to all. I should also note that I have got an advanced copy of the lecture. And my knowledge of these things tells, tells me that the lecture, the lecture usually comes out about a year after in published form. So I congratulate Professor Golding on being more than on time. And one other general comment. This is a new room, as Mr. Wheeler has noted. The first time I came to this room, there was a quiz competition going on. And Cobham, Professor Golding's faculty, was in the finals. And you know, there I was trying to look dignified and sitting in the front row and behaving myself. And I heard some shouting from the back, hui, 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 come on, come on, come on. When I look, there is my dean. <laughs> on top of his voice, dancing, dancing a jig. They won. And I could see that they won partly because of the, the spirit of their dean. So I commend the pro professor, not only for his professorial instincts, but also for his human instincts and his support for building his faculty. I don't know if you're going to dance tonight, but maybe. <laughs> the topic of this evening's lecture, the role of ICT in Jamaica's economic growth strategy, is topical indeed, and comes at a critical time in our national quest to, to achieve the goals of Vision 2030, and specifically Goal 3, which speaks to Jamaica's mission in guiding the nation to a prosperous future. To achieve this goal, outcome number 11 seeks, among other things, to deepen the application of science and technology to benefit all aspects of national development and to unleash the full creative potential of our people. Today, more than ever, information and communications technology is considered as one of the major factors contributing to economic recovery and sustained growth. UTEC Jamaica visualizes itself in a leadership role in facilitating Jamaica in developing technological capabilities and competencies for the advancement of national development. As the national university, we recognize the importance of ICT in our development agenda. We are always ready to join hands with all our government and non-governmental partners and the wider public to achieve this mission. As regards the wider Caribbean, CARICOM has also declared information and communications technology as a priority in its 2019 Regional Strategic Plan. At its 28th intersessional meeting, CARICOM approved a roadmap for a CARICOM single ICT space. According to CARICOM, this single ICT space is an ICT-enabled borderless space that fosters economic, social, and cultural integration for the betterment of Caribbean citizens. We therefore recognize that ICT is critical for enhancing productivity of all economic sectors. We look to ICT to transform the way we do things in service delivery, production, transportation, health, education, justice and the law, among other sectors. Good evening, Justice Harrison. Welcome. <laughs> there is no doubt that with the implementation of the appropriate policies and investments 
in the, in the enabling infrastructure that ICT will also equip more people to contribute to development. ICT can also transform opportunities for all, irrespective of location, background, gender, and disability. I hope that the recommendations made by Professor Golding this evening will serve to inform public policy and the development of programs that will address certain institutional and economic weaknesses that can improve Jamaica's ICT competitiveness and drive economic growth. Thank you all for being here, and as I conclude, I urge you to join us as we move forward to achieve this mission of increased competitiveness and growth. Thank you, and on to the main agenda. Information and Communication Technology, ICT, is a term which has become synonymous with fast, better, improvement, development, and growth. What does ICT mean to you and to me and to us? How many of us here have given serious thought to how information, communication, and technology affect and will continue to affect our daily lives? <coughs> President Bastiani, members of council, members of the diplomatic corps, his Excellency Fitzgerald Jeffrey, High Commissioner Trinidad and Tobago. I think I saw Mr. Enrique Victoria, First Counselor, Embassy of the Republic of Panama in Jamaica. Um, our family member, Carol Guntley, I saw her walking in. Deputy President Colin Giles, Mrs. Mercedes Dean, University Registrar, Chaplain. Vice Presidents, Associate Vice Presidents, Deans, Heads of School, Faculty, Colleagues, Family, and Friends. We are absolutely delighted that you could join us for the inaugural professorial lecture on how ICT will propel the economic growth strategy of our country, Jamaica. Whether we have our own thoughts about ICT or are involved in ICT, embrace ICT, or couldn't care less about it, what is certain is that we are in for a thought-provoking, stimulating, informational, educational, <coughs> and growth-enhancing evening. We anticipate that this lecture will charge us up and inspire our thoughts about ICT and how it will drive productivity. I certainly cannot think of a more competent person to engage us on this important topic than our very own Professor Paul Anthony Golding, who is becoming a household name in the ICT industry in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, and in the global arena. In fact, just earlier this week, my office had a call all the way from Ireland seeking to interview Professor Golding. So, what then about our esteemed lecturer that makes him the one to address us on this important topic? The speaker's breadth of expertise has been born out of his insatiable quest for knowledge gained through his studies at the University of the West Indies, the City University of New York, and the Nova Southeastern University. Professor Golding's academic prowess accounts in a great part for his success as an accountant, an entrepreneur, a manager, a director, and in higher education where he has remained longest as lecturer, tutor, research supervisor, head of school, and now dean of the largest academic unit at the University of Technology, Jamaica. Prof. Golding serves as a reviewer for the North American Case Writers Association and is in fact the brainchild 
or should I say the mastermind, behind the recent launch of the Caribbean Case Writers Association. He has written many cases, published in referee journals, presented at numerous conferences locally and internationally, won research grants and consultancies, and is an authority on ICT in the local print and electronic media, and I dare say outside of Jamaica too. This noble gentleman is well sought after, having gained worldwide recognition for his groundbreaking work in the development and implementation of the U-Touch software for the deaf and hard of hearing community who we have here today with us as well. Thank you. You may begin to wonder what expertise would a dean of a business college have to be working with the deaf community? Well, from where I stand, I can only say that this speaks to the real Paul Golding. He is innovative, he is creative, he has a caring personality and a huge heart for the people of his country, especially those in the minority. Prof. Golding's involvement in deaf education started when our neighbors at the Listomir Gilby School for the Deaf invited him to be a judge at the Listomir Gilby uh, Mr. and Miss Listomir Gilby competition. And through the fulfillment of that service, his love for humanity, his compassionate spirit and inquisitive mind ignited the IT passion within him to dig deep into the whys, the hows, and the why nots, resulting in the conception, the gestation, and the birth of U-Touch, a software designed to teach prepositions to the deaf. Before Professor Golding's research, the language of the deaf excluded preposition. Now think about it, ladies and gentlemen. What are the possible messages you communicate when you say, I want to study you, especially if boy likes girl. <laughs> now, <laughs> right? Boy or girl can communicate clearly, correctly, and completely. I want to study with you. I'm sure that's not what you were thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> so that leaves no room for ambiguity. But this evening is not about boy or girl. It is about what can result from purpose and from passion. By nature, Paul Golding is not quiet. The president just told you that a while ago. He likes excitement. And guess what? It is contagious in his office. You can't help it. He's always coming up with ideas and doing something new. His many awards in research, in innovation, in community service and teaching are evidence of his dedication, his hard work, and ultimately becoming a professor of management information systems. I am very sure that when Miss Dora and Mass Rudolph, the shopkeeper and the security guard, brought the third of five children into the world, they had no idea that their boy would someday become a professor. <laughs> they would be this evening to listen to Professor Golding. I'm sure they would be here if they were still alive. But his wife Andrea, his son Daniel, and other family members are here to fill that gap. Mrs. Golding, we salute you. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you will prove for yourself that our esteemed lecturer who enjoys sports, is intrigued by history and loves to read a good book, is one, who's, is one whose active mind, sometimes overactive, <laughs> makes him stand out, daring to be different, while always maintaining a posture of humility. 
His classmates at Nova Southeastern recall that as a student, Paul was brilliant, he was outspoken, he was focused, and an outstanding leader. Another of his close colleagues describes him well when she says, I've always found him to be a good listener. He's very approachable. He might not always agree with you, but he will listen. And sometimes he will come back and say, listen, you were right. So what is Professor Golding's favorite word? Listen. Please be sure this evening to straighten up and to listen every time you hear him say, listen. listen. That way, you simply cannot miss any aspect of this important engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and my happy privilege to invite to the podium the speaker of the evening, the prominent, the passionate, the potent, the purpose-driven, Paul Anthony Golding, Professor of Management, Information Systems. Dr. Maas, thank you uh, for that rousing introduction. And she said something in which I want to start with that. I want to start with history because we should never forget history. Um, when you look back, you, you learn so much from what has happened. And I want to go way back, and this is not going to be a long drawn out lecture, uh, but I, I, I want to put something in perspective. 1492, that's how far I'm going back. Wow. <laughs> 14, 1492, Christopher Columbus is about to take a voyage to Asia. Back then, there were two views. One view was that the world was flat. The other view was that the world was round. Christopher Columbus believed that the world was round. But back then, the persons who believed that the world was round was in a mi minority. And not only that they were in a minority, they had no clue as to how big the world was. So Christopher Columbus decided to voyage to Asia because I didn't want to go around the Cape of Good Hope and the Ottoman Empire had controlled that route through Egypt and what have you. So they, they couldn't go that way, it was too dangerous. So Christopher Columbus decided that he wanted to go to another side to get to Asia. So he started his voyage and he ended up in the Bahamas. Back then, Europe thought that the world consisted of Asia, Africa, and Europe. That was it. They had no concept that there was a Pacific Ocean. And Christopher came and, in quotation, discovered. <laughs> so he came and discovered and he was very disappointed because what he came here for was spice and gold and all that kind of a thing because he thought he was in Asia. Realized that, that that wasn't the case. And by 1506, he died, disappointed. Not knowing though, the door that he had opened, he opened the door to a new economic reality called mercantilism, in which there were wars fought, people killed, West Indies traded for Canada and all those kind of things because at the time, the small West Indies was so powerful versus what we now know of what is Canada. Right, so, so as not to bore you, let's fast forward to 2000. 510 years later, thereabouts. And in 2005, 
Thomas Friedman declared, ironically, that the world was flat. So we are coming full circle. We are coming from their believing that, listen, the world was round, at least for the persons who knew, the educated people, to coming back to thinking that the world is now flat. Now, why are we saying that the world is flat? The flat world refers to changes and progress that has been generated through the use of ICT, or digital technologies, which includes computer hardware, software, and networks at their core. So if I go back to Christopher Columbus a little bit, Christopher, after he found the new world, and he thought that, well, boy, listen, this is not it, um, underestimating just how powerful of a discovery, and again in quotation marks, that he made, didn't realize just how much he had done by just coming, because it facilitated trade. It facilitated genocide too, but it facilitated trade. And for a time, it, at least it, what it did was to increase wealth in particular countries. So in 2005, so I'm back to current, to this century, uh, Thomas Friedman said that, listen, the world was flat. And he thought that, well, boy, listen, the world is going to be transformed by information and communications technology. And I want to suggest to you that he also has underestimated just how powerful this new paradigm that is coming into being will be. And the working hypothesis this evening will be that this new paradigm, we must be an integral part of this new paradigm. And I'm also suggesting that it's the first time in our history that there is a new paradigm that will be taking place in the world. And we as a country will have control over the decisions that we make. Because in the 60s and even before that, we had no control over what we did. So, the rate, scope, and depth and disruption caused by the growth of ICT would suggest that Friedman underestimated the transformative power of the technology. We are now living in an era where knowledge, product, manufacturing, love, sex, and virtually everything it seems can be digitized. <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to digital life. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go through this whole aspect of what we call digital life, and we'll look at how we get, how, we, how have we gotten to this point. Forgive me for going to and fro, all right guys? So a while ago I was at 2005, and now going back to 1997, all right? A significant event happened in 1997 international event. What happened in 1997 is that there was this general agreement in trade and services called GATS. And what it did was all of the companies, the telecommunication companies that were monopolies, they had to be broken up. And as a result of that, what has happened is that there is this tremendous growth in the use of ICT because of this one seminal event. In, in, in 1997. As a result of this event, Jamaica started the process of liberalization of the telecommunication sector in 2000. And by 2003, we had completed that liberalization. We were the first country in the English-speaking Caribbean to liberalize our telecommunication sector. And what I'm suggesting here is that telecommunications is the route to this digital life that we are now experiencing. And that's why that event in 1997 was so seminal. Just looking at some data here, in 2006, 
this is six years after liberalization, only 29% of Jamaicans use the internet. What were they using it for? Information, primarily, email, chat. By 2004, this change, information went down to 17%. Social media, which wasn't even around then, moved to 36%, leisure 26%. So there has been some changes that has taken place in the sector as a result of this liberalization. But let me look a little bit closer to what digital life is all about. And I want to put this in a perspective in which we can even understand some of the international issues that are taking place, all right? Downs in 2009 described digital life this way. Downs looked at three things, Moore's Law, Metcalfe's Law, and the Law of Disruption. And even though this is all theoretical and sound like too much academic stuff, I'm going to do it in a way and it's not boring, all right? <laughs> so let's look at Moore's Law. Moore's Law said this, computers, every 12 to 18 months, the processing power of computers will double while the price will more or less hold constant. This was from 1965 that Moore said this. This has not changed, all right? What has happened over the period up to now is that the big computers that used to be in rooms are now in your pockets, all right? Easily fit in your pocket. I'm not just easily fit in your pocket, but more powerful now than those big computers that used to be in a room, all right? So this has continued. So what has happened is that computers have become smaller, cheaper, and it's the same thing with data storage. They used to see people walking around with big reams of stuff. Now you have a little jump drive or whatever else with an awful lot of data. You have phone that you can listen to music for years and never listen to it to one song for a second time because you have so much storage. So that's the first law. And at least you can relate to this law, right? Mm -hmm. The second law that he talks about is Metcalfe's law, in which he says that, let me simplify this. The more person who is on a network, the more valuable that network becomes. All right? Look at Facebook. Facebook has two billion people on. Facebook is very valuable because of the number of persons who are on that network. So the more persons you have on a network, and, and that's why Facebook is saying, okay, I'm giving you all this for free. It's not really free because they're using you. As a colleague of mine who is here to say, often say, if it's free, it means that you are the product. <laughs> all right? <laughs> but it, it but that's what Metcalfe's law is saying. Now, let me put these two laws together because what Metcalfe's law says that, listen, um, sorry, Moore's law says that, listen, faster, cheaper, right? Metcalfe's law says, listen, as a network grows, um, the more valuable that network becomes. Those two laws has created all kinds of virtualization in the world, all right? These two laws create a third law called the law of disruption, which says that technology changes exponentially, but social, economic, and legal systems change this incrementally. And we can relate to this, right? We see where all of these things are happening so fast, but the legal system just cannot keep up. The social system cannot keep up, right? And this leads to periodic upheavals which are unavoidable. And I dare say to you now that we are going through periodic upheavals. And what we see happening, for instance, with economic nationalism that is being trumpeted by... By, by Donald, you said. 
<laughs> um, and even Brexit, for instance, these are all responses to changes that are taking place in the society because of all that is happening with technology. It's not, listen, when I was growing up, it was BBC News at 8 o'clock. Some of you can relate to this, in which you would know what was going on in the world. Now, as it happened, before it happened, <laughs> it, it, you are hearing about it, and even these other responses with fake news and all of these things are responses to the changes that is taking place because the technology is, is forcing these changes. Because it allows persons now to create their own news. And if you have a group of persons who thinks the same way as you, you can therefore feed them with whatever news. It doesn't have to be an established means. But all of this, what I'm saying, is as a result of these two laws. These three laws, really. And these disruptions we're seeing all around us, and some of them we're taking for granted because we are all here experiencing them. We're seeing 3D printing in which, for instance, your, um, it is expected that you may be able to just print your own medication. So instead of going and buying tablets and you have a 3D printer, prescription comes, you can therefore print it, take your tablet, and you're cool. <laughs> um, there is the whole question of autonomous driving and you, you can see how likely this is to be very very disruptive mm -hmm. right what it means is what we're seeing creeping in is that cars are parking themselves mm -hmm. cars are driving themselves mm -hmm. right it means that persons who used to teach people to drive cars are going to work mm -hmm. that's, that's what it means mm -hmm. right what is also happening is that even Warfare gets changed because of technology coming as part, a new technology coming into the fore. So you, you're seeing now what's coming out is autonomous warfare in which there are drones that can make decisions, adapt on the fly, take a hundred pictures of you, recognize you even if you have on um, makeup and disguise and you. <laughs> No collateral damage. Mm -hmm. Professor Bassiani is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Mercedes is fine. <laughs> but these are some of the things that are happening. And like I say, because we're experiencing them in real time, we're not taking them very seriously. There is also the whole question of the second machine age. And again, I'm going to run through some of these slides very quickly. Because these changes are dichotomous in nature. They will bring benefits. But they're also going to be serious ethical and other disadvantages associated with these, two, sorry, with these technologies coming to the fore. This lecture could have been titled The Internet of Things. But if I had put that, none of you would come. Maybe you'd <laughs> But in 2008, 2009, something significant and somehow seemingly inconsequential happened. What happened in 2008, somewhere between 2008 and 2009, is that there were more machines on the internet than there were people. Now, why is this important? What it meant at that time is that we, have, we got to a stage in which machines now were communicating with each other more than people were communicating with each other. That inflection point that took place in 2008 is called the Internet of Things. For persons who are not in the technology era, this means nothing. But I'm going to show you just how important it is. And why, as a result of this, we have to become part of the internet age. Because if we don't, we are going to remain poor.
we have moved from a stage in which um, Bill Gates expected that there will be a computer in everybody's desk to a stage you know, in which it is expected that everybody is connected. I can assure you that everybody here is connected to a network right now. I dare anybody to raise their hand. <laughs> Every single soul inside here is connected to a network. And what the Internet of Things is saying is that it's not just your regular devices that can therefore be connected to the network. It's everything else that can therefore connect it to a network and can send and receive data. Everything. In fact, in 2012, the World Economic Forum declared that data was a new class of economic asset, similar to currency or gold, data. What does Google trade in? What does um, Facebook trade in? Data. Facebook says, tell me everything about yourself. Tell me that you went to KC and which other primary school you went to and everything. Tell me everything so I know everything about you and I'm therefore going to use that data to trade. That's, that's exactly what it is. It has brought on a whole heap of other issues about privacy and all of that, but that's one other time. All this huge amount of data is termed big data. Big data has a very nebulous definition because we really don't know exactly what it is or is going to become yet. So the definitions, any definitions that you see is going to be deliberately nebulous because it is evolving, all right? But the data, all this data is coming from social networks, cell phones, credit cards, loyalty cards, health cards, traffic, energy systems, meter, all these things that we now have, which is data driven. What this massive amount of data has created is what is called analytics. It means that you go on a website and they can tell you what you like, what other people like you liked, what you may like, create a profile of you, and do all these kinds of things. All right? Um, uh, uh, this, this may take a little bit more time than I want, but I, I, I need to explain this to you. Just an example of how data is being used. Target supermarket in the United States wanted to, uh, wanted to increase sales. And they realize that there are certain things that happen in your life that changes your purchasing pattern. You get married, you change your purchasing pattern. You get divorced, you change your purchasing pattern. You have children, you change your purchasing pattern. And what they were targeting, what they wanted to know is when a woman is pregnant. But they wanted to know from early. They didn't want to know when she went and registered a child because they wanted to have a Lego. So they gave all their people loyalty cards and what have you. And they looked at the data and they wanted to find out what are the different behaviors that women exhibit at different stages of their pregnancy. What do they buy? <laughs> what do they buy? And they needed to know, they, they, didn't just, they needed to know what trimester you were in based on the data that they got from you. And they realize that, well, early in the pregnancy, you want unscented stuff, right? <laughs> if, if I truncate this, basically what they found out was, listen, at particular points in your pregnancy, you shop for different things. All right? There's a time that you start sh shopping for vitamins and all of that, and you ladies know what these things are. All right? But they, they found this out. And what they did was to start sending coupons to persons 
early in the process based on where they thought their, their, um, uh, where their pregnancy was. And this was the most interesting part of it. A father came to the Target store and wanted to know, why are you sending my daughter these coupons? <laughs> and was, was upset and asked them not to send it back again. She's not having sex. Suffice to say that he went back and apologized. <laughs> but understand this, guys, even though we may consider this a joke, it may be intrusive. All right? It is, it, is, it is likely intrusive because what is happening is that persons are collecting data on you and knowing things about you that you may not want other people to know. But that's what is happening with data. So with all this data and the Internet of Things, it is causing a revolution in several areas. It's causing a revolution in industry. The way industry is now being set up, at least by the Germans and some others, is that they're putting sensors in everything so they know exactly what is happening at any point in time during the process. And the information can therefore be sent back and decision made in real time. So their sensors and everything. So that is what that is happening um, on the on the industry standpoint. And what it also means enough is that all this data can take you from from the entire supply chain to destination, mm -hmm. right? Meaning that to the consumer. So there's data that you can track all along the process. I'll, I'll leave out some of this. Agriculture is also changing. What you have now is precision farming, in which you have techniques in which the soil can be tested by machine, determine the type of soil, make a decision as to what should be added to the soil, and so on along the way. Nowadays, if our farmers are going away for farm work, they need more than they used to do. They need to know more than they used to do. That has changed because technology has influenced now exactly how farming techniques go. You can tell, for instance, this disease is there and it's not a human being that is checking it. It's a machine that is checking it and sending the data to and fro. Smart cities. Another big change that is taking place. Warwick is pushing smart cities. And smart cities have all kinds of aspects to it, all right? There's smart lighting, smart traffic, smart advertising, in which all of these things are connected. You are passing an ad, and because it's you passing the ad, a particular ad comes up, all right? Yes. Traffic can be redirected as a result of, uh, as to what is going on. You can have Wi-Fi all over the place, you know, so on your traffic light you have Wi-Fi, and on that traffic light, no, sorry, not traffic light, um, on your light pole, right? And on that light pole, you may have a small advertising board, which knows that is you passing because there's another device on you which identifies you, and therefore knows that these are the things that you like, and then the things come. And you're seeing some of this already creeping in, you know. When you go online to buy something and you have asked for it, it then says, all of a sudden, you are looking for a hotel and all of a sudden, all kinds of hotel coming up, right? So what we're saying is that, listen, that will be transferred to things around you, all right? We're also seeing what is called conversational commerce coming into being. Jack, Alexia, order me a pizza. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alexia is a device from Amazon, as you know. Mm -hmm. And Alexia will order you a pizza because they may be connected to Pizza Pizza. Mm -hmm. And the order goes there. They know exactly where you are. And order is still before you know it, somebody comes. And we may get to the point in which the order is sent to a 3D printer and the printer prints <laughs> <laughs> pizza. <laughs> and, and, and
and, and this is not far-fetched to know, in which the printer prints the pizza for you, and there's no need for any delivery. I won't go into smart cities too much, no. This last one I just want to mention, because when I saw it, I'm saying, huh? Mm -hmm. This now is in health. Google has started this project called Calico, which means California Life Company. And its aim is to extend lifespan. What is being contemplated is this. Is that every 10 years or so, you go and get your checkup. And what we'll do is to look at all your tissues and all of that and repair them. <laughs> so it repairs tissue, um, you get medication and you get something for about 10 years and then 10 years after you go back. It is not promising immortality, because you know, I'm saying if I chop one over you, can <laughs> All right? <laughs> However, if you're just getting old and your knees them start creak because you play too much squash, <laughs> <laughs> you can get those things repaired easily. Barry, we need to talk to the people. <laughs> All right? But that's what it is. And they're saying that, listen, in 20 or 30 years, they figure that if you have the right amount of money, they can extend your lifespan for so maybe up to 150. 150. But that is it. And listen, Google has given them 36% of 2 billion, whatever that works out to, right? As part of the funds for this project. So they're taking it seriously. It's not like we're well, listen, uh, we, we're not serious about this. But all I'm saying to you is that all of these things are now in train, right? There's nanorobots, but I, if I stay too long on this, I, I'll not get to the real point of what we're here for. Um, let's now look, um, let's look at this now in the context of productivity in Jamaica. The purpose of what I've been saying so far is to suggest that the, there are serious disruptions that are taking place in the world and there's going to be a new economic order surrounding all of this disruption that is taking place. That's why I'm suggesting. It's like there was no electricity before electricity comes and you are creating some kind of development plan and electricity is not a part of it, if you get what I mean. <coughs> What I'm suggesting here is that any kind of growth and productivity plan must take into consideration all of these changes that are taking place. You can't ignore them. And what we should do as a country is to be, as much as we possibly can, on the forefront of this, not on the forefront of creating the technologies, you know, because we do not have the capacity to do this. The capacity that we have is to ensure that we have the capacity to participate and to use it to, to have growth. Growth has been elusive in Jamaica. Labor productivity between 2000 and 2015 has reduced steadily from 602,000 per worker to, to in 2015, 539,000. All sectors have shown reduction. And some of them that have not declined are not doing good themselves because they are below the national average. And the numbers that I showed you just now, um, the numbers that I showed you just now was the national average. But in the early days, in the early 70s when technology came along, there was this paradox. What, they, what was happening then is that the more technology that you invested in, it seemed to show that there was an inverse relation with productivity. In other words, you invest in a lot of money in technology, but productivity is not going up. That has more or less changed, right? It is established that ICT will increase productivity. 
In fact, what the economists have done is to disaggregate um, capital, for instance, into ICT capital and non-ICT capital. So they recognize it because they're trying to measure it, all right? And there's this other factor that they have in looking at productivity, which is called total factor productivity, all right? These are just some preliminary results. One, what total factor productivity, by the way, is looking at how efficiently you use all your other assets and how innovative you are. What it shows for us is that as a country, we're not very innovative. In fact, as a region, we're not very innovative. All right? So total fa factor productivity is low. What we have also noted is that in Jamaica, when there was a growth in ICT capital, our GDP increased. Maybe about three times. So maybe not enough data points yet to say, yes, this is a definitive. But if we look at other countries, we see where that is happening. When ICT factor productivity grows, what happens is that GDP also grows. So, if we establish that there is a correlation between ICT capital growth, right, and GDP growth, the next question then is how do we enable the use of ICT as part of our growth strategy? And I want to just explore here for a little bit the enabling environment that is here and ready for that to happen. Jamaica is going through what is called a demographic transition in which for the first time in 100 years, we have more persons in the working age community than ever before. What it means is this, is that we have, there has been a reduction in births, so that sector between zero and 14, 15 has reduced. The older category has increased, but it's also at a decreasing rate. So what you have is this large number of persons of working age who can therefore help to increase productivity, can help to produce and um, increase productivity. So we have a window here of about 15, 20 years, maybe 30 years, because after that, what you're going to have happening is that you're going to have more people in the older age group who you're going to need to have on pension, and our pension system not too good, all right? Our, our pension system is not too good. There are too many people who are not on pension because they are, um, the, the jobs that they are having are not jobs in which you pay taxes or pay pension or anything like that. All right? So we have to use this period in order to try and facilitate growth. The policy focus, therefore, should be on improvements in formal education output, managing the educational system to build social capital, improving social mobility, and forging social cohesion. That's what is being recommended here as it relates to this en enabling environment associated with demographics, all right? The other thing that we need to look at is ICT infrastructure. What we're saying here is that Persons need to be able to have access to ICT. What, what the data suggests is that there's a 10%, when, when there's a 10% increase in broadband penetration, what it does is to increase GDP between 0.3 and 1.4%. We're looking for four and five, right? And what we're saying is that this is a means of increasing GDP. We have seen it done in other countries, US and EU has done this, and they have had greater GDP growth associated with improvements in um, ICT penetration. Prof. Fassiani said this earlier about the single ICT space. What I'm recommending is that we move with alacrity, using Tony's word, 
towards creating a single ICT space in the Caribbean. We must be able to move around in the Caribbean and we move seamlessly. And I say this in this context. When you take the 15 CARIFORUM countries and put them all together, including 80, which is about 10 of the 17 million, because you have about 17 million, and 80 is about 10, right? So 80 is a huge part of it. When you put us all together, we fit in Guatemala nicely. <laughs> Just in Guatemala nicely. I'm suggesting here very strongly that we look seriously on creating a single ICT space, not just to talk about it. So I'm asking the ambassador to speak to his government <laughs> because it is important that we do this. It's important that we look at how do we grow size, all right? We must scale up. If we continue to be just small companies, and I'm going to come back to this, we're not going to grow as a people. We're going to remain informal. We're not going to pay any taxes. We're not going to have any health care for the people who are in these informal things. We are not going to have persons who can, therefore, get any pension. If you go now to go to the state and you're going through immigration, there's not people they are dealing with you anymore. anymore. All right, there's not people dealing with you. Is, is machine dealing with you, right? And I'm saying that these changes are taking place. If you notice how oh, they're building houses now, they're not usually, they're not taking any block, any six inch and four inch block. Cast up, a, um, frame up a place, cast it. So the people them who normally do these other kind of work, work that there no more. So all I'm saying here is that, listen, we have to take education very seriously. But here's the problem with how we deal with education now. We do not like creativity. We do not reward creativity. We reward what is right. This is the answer that you're supposed to get. All right, we need to move away from that. We need to reward creativity. We need to stop insisting that people must be able to recall. Let me inform, please. If I want to recall anything, I can put it on there. All right? If I'm going to my doctor and she wants to write a prescription and she goes online, type in the generic name, find what she wants, and she's not writing the prescription anymore, no. Because she click on it, send to the pharmacy. And it can either go to the pharmacy straight or it goes on the piece of paper that I want. Mm -hmm. So if we're not teaching application, ladies and gentlemen, and some of my colleagues, all right, we, we are wasting our time with our students. Your students are not engaged if you do not engage their minds. All right? And the, the approach that we take, even in examining our students and all that, needs to change because the, the, the paradigm has changed. All right? The paradigm has seriously changed. The, the current paradigm is one in which if you needed something, you needed to go in the library and ask for number and know which shelf the book is on and all of that. Nobody's doing that no more. So it is important that we learn how to foster innovation. And I, I want to say, I, I just want to push in a little plug here. I didn't pass common entrance. In fact, um, I didn't go to high school, at, at least at first. I, I went to Tarrant Junior Secondary School. All right? And there's one Pat Eves who is sitting down here who taught me. All right? And although the society thought that we wouldn't do well, and it's not just me, I'm just representing. We all did well. All right? We all did well. And I want to just plug in one other thing here, because this is supposed to be kind of autobiographical um, in nature. So I'm coming back to this, all right? Um, 
I was talking to my sister the other day, and I told her about this, and she started to cry. And she said, boy, Paul, from pit toilet to professor. <laughs> because we, and my brothers and sisters are here, we grew up, we grew up poor. Sorry, we didn't grow up poor. We never had no money. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we never really grew up poor. We just, we just never had no money. All right? And we, what we had, and it, it really doesn't matter your background, you know, it really matters what values that you have and what values you have. what values your parents inculcate in you from birth. So even though we never have no money, we couldn't beg, because that was all to the question. All right, we, we couldn't steal. I mean, if we came home with anything, and we never had no money to get it, which we didn't have, we had to carry it back, because it was known that we didn't have it. So how did you get this? Huh? But you had, you had to carry it back next week, and you couldn't come back with it. All right? That was it. I just mentioned one other thing, because this was in the late 60s and what have you. And in those days, shopping only took place with certain people on a Sunday. Some of you can relate to this. All right? Because shop never used to open on a Sunday. No. All right? Is the shoemaker, the helper, and so on, who they would open shop for. So all this Sunday shopping in which, why oh, I'm going to Mega Mart on a Sunday and all those things, wasn't the case. If you went on a Sunday, you, you knew what you were. And everybody else knew what you were. And listen, we wore all those things very proudly. All right? We wore all those things very, very proudly. I, I remember I couldn't go to school on a Friday because it was three of us, and there was only money for two. And the youngest one is the one that had to stay on because, yeah, sorry, you had to make choices. All right? And then there were the days in which you couldn't go to school if your sister was not working in the canteen because if she's not working in the canteen, there's no lunch. <laughs> All right? Uh, and the way it's going is that you have to wait until everybody else eat lunch. And if there was anything left back, right, you'd be able to get lunch. And by 11.30 when bell ringing, I used to be very, very hungry. All right? And I used to wait at the step. And if my sister was here, she'd maybe break out in tears. But I used to wait out down at the step at half a tree primary school. And my head. So that didn't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and then we have to wait until um, everybody finished there about 12.30 and then you get a ball of slush, as they used to call it, all right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever was left. But again, guys, as far as we were concerned, as it related to education, we made the best as it was, and we were never sorry for ourselves, all right? Bottom line, though, is this, that we must be far more innovative in our educational system. And that's why I'm spending so much time on this, you know, because, listen, let me tell you this. Let me tell you what I've learned as an educator. If I teach Mercedes Dean foolishness, it is going to have a multiply effect yes. through, the community, yes. uh, through the society. Because you won't take it as gospel, because Professor Golding is our this, and he must be right. And then you go teach everybody else the same foolishness. And before you know it, <laughs> and that goes for anything else that we're doing. And when I say teachers here now, I'm not necessarily talking about classroom teaching. I'm talking about any kind of teaching. If you're teaching them sports, anything at all, teachers, listen, invest the money there. Two other things that I need to talk about, digital inclusion. <clears throat> Dr. Maas mentioned about my association with the deaf community. Uh, we must ensure that our policies include 
and we take specific attention, pay specific attention to persons who do not have a voice. All right? We must look out for them. The students that I've worked with, and myself included, the work that we have done with the deaf community is the most satisfying work ever. I do not need to be dragged or anything like that to help the deaf community. When the students are working with them, they, they, they're learning so much because there is another culture within our culture that we didn't know about, and we start learning. And that's the beauty of this world, is that there are so many different cultures. Because if not, the world gets very boring. Because all of us are the same. So what I'm suggesting here is that growth without inclusivity, not just for persons who don't have a voice, but everybody else, it is going to cause wealth distribution, which is skewed, and you are going to have chaos. All right? We also need to look at improving technology in certain sectors. Agriculture, extremely poor as it relates to productivity. Construction, wholesale and retail, hotels and restaurants, real estate, all these are sectors which are below the national average as it relates to productivity. And again, let me say this, guys. We must also take into consideration the, what is happening in the Caribbean as it relates to some priority areas that the Caribbean has mentioned. And this is coming out of Car CARICOM, cultural activities. I just want to make just say one thing about cultural. We, we tend to look at these areas in a way in which we figure that, listen, these are not important areas. You can start an entire industry around our culture. You know? And, all right? yeah. and, and when I talk about an industry, I'm talking about all other sectors supporting it. Yes. All right? When you look at English football, for instance, it's, a, it's an entire seg, um, ecosystem. That's the word I'm looking for. Because the people who, who do the feel and make sure that you can run and slide on your knees and whatever, you try that here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right? Um, are part of this ecosystem, right? And all of the other things that surrounds it. And what it does is to create wealth. I also want to say this, guys, and I may be criticized for this. We need to scale our companies. This fascination with micro, small, and medium-sized enterprise has its place. But if these businesses are not growing, they're not helping nobody. All right? These businesses need to grow so that you, they, they migrate into bigger companies and new small companies come with innovation and what have you. But if your company remains micro, small, and medium-sized forever, what is happening? You, we are not growing that way. And what I'm suggesting is that technology should be infused in all of these things. And we should look, we must look at ourselves regionally. As Jamaicans, we ought not to be looking at 144 square miles. We must be looking beyond that and looking regionally for growth and to create economies of scale. If not, there will be no economies of scale and it means that you will remain small. The role that government must play in this, especially MSTEM, must be to create the vision for this change. They can encourage innovation by using procurement, which they're already doing, to drive innovation, in which what they're saying is that, listen, if you're a more um, innovative company, we're likely to give you preferential treatment in terms of getting into government procurement. Mm -hmm. It may sound like, well, well, what you're doing is doing preferential treatment. But if you, you must be strategic. And when you're strategic, you are going to look at some things over other things. Other than that, you have no notion as, as to what you want to do and what you want to become. I want to conclude that by saying this. One, I have mentioned about our poor growth. Two, I have mentioned about um, what are some of the enabling 
things that are happening in Jamaica which can spur growth. I also want to mention that we are a high crime country, which we all know. But there are some important positives that are happening in this country that we also must look at and not to concentrate just on the negatives. I'm looking at Kenya's election the other day and I'm saying, but hold on, this is what used to happen in Jamaica. Day after election, you can't come on road. You better listen to news. In fact, day of election, you just go vote and go home. And then day after election, what is going to happen is that there's going to be war. This is what we see happening in Kenya. And we're saying, well, okay, we have become a little bit more mature because we change government as long as, as very quickly now if you're not doing what we want you to do. And it is done seamlessly. All right? Improvements in our road infrastructure is significant. All right? Being able to get to Ocho Reyes in 45 minutes is no bore. All right? It means that you can, that commerce can take place between these locations and be done quickly and efficiently by, uh, by, 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 by means of road. Our presence internationally is growing. And let me tell you something about this presence internationally that's growing through sports. You know. It has made us a more confident set of persons. People know our colors. People know our anthem. By the way, I was talking to one of my brethren the other day who was from England, and I'm saying, the English anthem, all it says, God save the queen. <laughs> Not more. <laughs> That's all it says. God save the queen. And I, I recall what, was, what we commented on then was how our leaders, when we were going into independence, right? The attention that they paid to our symbols. The national anthem is a wicked national anthem. Yes. Yeah. 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 Our national pledge says before God and all mankind. Right? We, we, we were never parochial in our views. Right? We were never thinking that, well, boy, listen, God save the queen alone. <laughs> What we were saying is that, listen, we are responsible to God and the whole of mankind, right? That's what we said in our national pledge, all right? And just to continue here, our telecommunications infrastructure is as good as there is anywhere in the world, all right? Anywhere there is in the world. I see people from Ireland, it was said that somebody from Ireland called me and was talking to me for a long time and they want to come and interview and what have you. And what they're saying is that, um, so did you sell person name? Dennis O'Brien seemed to have spent more money in the Caribbean than he did in Ireland. Although he's the richest man in Ireland. But our infrastructure is as good as theirs, if not better. All right? Again, the whole thing with our um, demographics shows that we have the opportunity to grow. I think what we must do, we must do, is to accept Right? understand and deal with some of the issues that are negative. And then what we must also do is to see how do we improve on those things that is going very well for us. Right? For us to grow. Everything that we happen all at once don't work that way. All right? Growth takes time. Change takes time. And then all of a sudden everything happens. All right? There's this analogy that I like to make. We went to a, my aunt's funeral in West Milan a couple of years ago, and we went crab bush. And when we went to crab bush in the night, and, and we got all the crabs, and they, they decided that they were going to boil the crabs. And they started to put the crabs in cold water. And we are saying, no, on a side go. You need to put the crabs in hot water. And they said, no, just, just learn here. So we sat and we learned, right? And what we learned is that, listen, when you put the crab in the lukewarm water, all they do is to keep adjusting their body temperature as the water gets hotter, all right? And by the time they're boiling, they're too weak to fight. 
<laughs> they're far too weak to fight, so there's no, there's no loose claws or anything like that in the zinc pan because they did not get a chance to feel the water getting hot, I'm sorry, go into that hot water immediately and start to fight. Get me? I'm saying to you that that is the way change takes place. It is gradual and then sudden. All right? There is enough happening in our society which shows that change is taking place. It is gradual and we have to be aware of it and be patient with it and then it will become sudden. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proffering here that ICT must be, because it is changing, what we are doing so significantly and so dramatically must be part of our growth strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Good evening. I am not too sure what you say after a lecture like this. I must confess. It even ended with romance. We are not disappointed. And I must confess, I have a very short attention span. So when I go through this, you know that it is something else. Professor Golden, thank you very much, sir. This is just fantastic. We are very proud that you are part of our community at the university. We, our minds have been broadened, we have been challenged, and we have been inspired. And we are seeing that poverty is behind us and the road to... Somebody was saying prosperity. The road to... <laughs> there are good days ahead of us. <laughs> Thank you very much. And many thanks to the team who worked along with you. This has been most successful. The team from the College of Business and Management and the wider university community, and our friends from Lister Mayor Gilby, uh, who help us to share the word. The partnership is strengthened, and we feel so proud to have you this evening. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm sure there are many questions and you want to talk more about it and continue the dialogue, but we want to do so after over drinks. So, okay. I have a team of persons um, that work with us, work with me uh, in getting things like this done, and they are truly awesome. Um, I, I don't know if the team is out here, if you guys can come. Come in, come please guys, come, come please. Come. When you, when you have a team and they seem far happier than you are, you know, there's something is going on. So, um, thank you very much, guys. Um, I'm not seeing Anthony. Um, and my extended persons, please stand up to you guys. Um, Dr. Myers won't stand, but, but Sharon will stand. A, a group of persons, guys, who, it's because you spend so much time at work, because you spend more time at work than at home, you know. You, you should. You should. <laughs> uh, you, you should. You should make sure as much as possible that your work life is such that it is one that you want to go to, but that in the evening that you want to go. All right. <laughs> but this. This is an awesome crew, guys. Really awesome crew. And to your audience, very distinguished audience. Uh, we thank you so much for coming and making it very successful and we look forward to the partnership. Thank you.